Hello and welcome to another week of 52 weeks. This is week 11. This week we're going to be looking at chapter 3, Natural Resources. If you made it through chapter 2, it was broken up into several parts to get through it. Uh, and I think we're going to be doing the same in the natural resources. Even though this is a short chapter, there is a, a lot to just be combined. And I'm trying to keep things within five to eight minutes in length. So I'm trying to keep them shorter. So this week, when we look at the natural resources, the current form of Harrisburg started in the late 1800s, beginning of the 1900s, um, as far as the, the growth of Harrisburg. So in the, this uh, chapter, it's giving you a background of what Harrisburg looked like at the time. You know, imagine in Harrisburg of unpaved streets, uh, limited park and public space, limited clean water, and uh, limited proper sewer, and a river full of refuse, or it was used as a, a way to get rid of trash or sewage. And it looked much different than it does today. This was a time of horrible conditions all around the city. Uh, you know, if you think about unpaved roads and, and just the level of, uh, or the quality of spaces around here. Uh, this was true for other cities. Um, it was recognized that change was needed and one of those persons that was a change agent was Mira Lloyd Doc. She was an individual that you can read up on, but there's some background in this chapter about that. She was college educated. Uh, she believed in social activism and uh, that there's a belief in changing the civic nature of the, the, the city itself. Look at these conditions. You'd be looking around and thinking, well, things could be better. The uh, term city beautiful was a term that was connected into here when uh, Doc was around 47 years of age and she made a speech to the Harrisburg Board. Board of Trades in 1900. She then partnered up with the American Civic Association, it was the J. Horace McFarland, and uh, this movement gained uh, strength to convince leaders and residents that municipal improvement was necessary. This movement was also calling for a greater civic awareness. So the City Beautiful movement process took about 15 years. So it's notable because it was the first time that the city looked at a comprehensive plan for municipal improvements. So when we talk about City Beautiful in Harrisburg, we have to keep it in the context of the City Beautiful movement that was happening around the whole country. So if you go back and do some research into um, cities all around, they were kind of all the same in this, this state of uh, disarray in that the quality of life living in a lot of uh, high dense areas was not that great. People stacked upon each other. We dealt with a lot of influx of population. We've got a lot of immigrants coming in. Uh, we have a lot of conditions that the, this living conditions were just really poor. This is all important to know because it's a, a starting point for how people think of the city in a larger viewpoint and context. The main leading concept that came uh, out of this movement was from Warren Manning's Green Belt of Parks. Uh, Manning was a student of Frederick Law Olmsted. This name may be familiar for those who are uh, have been to New York City or Boston. Uh, in New York City, there was the Central Park, and in Boston, there was the Emerald Necklace. There's other places that Olmsted actually uh, had also influenced and throughout the nation that you can also look up. What's fascinating is his, uh, he's a landscape architect. Uh, he had a, uh, an idea, particularly with the area of Harrisburg and the Greenbelt, that there was a naturalistic approach, that there was a linking of all the parts of the city, and it provided a structure that is still evident today as we use our city in recreation. So when we wander around the city and we have Riverfront Park, or we go to Wildwood or the uh, State Hospital grounds, and also any of the park parkways that are uh, part of the Greenbelt, all of this was meant to be interconnected to uh, really surround our city in a, uh, a natural way so that we can enjoy some space outside of this high dense area. And this became, uh, this was a process that involved the planning of the green spaces and the civil engineering of infrastructure uh, and also including uh, Riverfront Park. So again, it's a municipal process. It took a lot of uh, alignment people coming together and wanting this to happen, but also making sure that there's funds, the economics of this thing uh, happening, all of this was put into place. At the time, the Riverfront Park solved the need to contain both the stormwater and the sewer, and this was done along the bank of the river. So even today, when we go and jog or bike or longboard uh, or walk Riverfront Park, you can see there's notes where the drains are or the, uh, the culverts are there for uh, access. 
What's important to remember in uh, Manning's idea of a city as a park, this was forward thinking and it's still evident in Harrisburg's urbanism. It's amazing because right now we're coming back in a lot of cities in the U.S. They're thinking about the idea of walkability. And this was critical back then, something that they've uh, been thinking about, about how we use our cities and how we inhabit our cities. Over the past decade, planners and city dwellers have sought to encourage and cherish this very same thing. So we're returning back to something that was pretty... Uh, pretty avant-garde at the time. Another thing we think about is the, besides the major parks of the riverfront, reservoir, Wildwood, Manning envisioned the East Corridor connecting uh, via State Street, Forrester, and Market to be tree-lined boulevards for pedestrian level. So there's a continuity between East and West going from the river the whole way uh, up into Allison Hill. The inclusion of informal plantings of native plants was innovative at the time, and part of the current approach to any uh, green belt restoration that is going on right now. So through this past 100 plus years, much of Manning plan has been unfinished or uh, local conditions have changed to fit other uses that weren't intended to the plan. So even though we had a comprehensive plan that was well known at the time, over the time of 100 years, uh, people and organizations have uh, changed and modified it. This would be great to actually show in the historic places of natural uh, historic landscape that this was an asset that should be restored and appreciated in the future. So there's some things to be thinking about within the City Beautiful movement that's well worth researching. It's not really covered in the uh, comp plan, um, but it is discussed about what the history of the uh, place was. And there's a group that's working on uh, putting up an African-American monument. June 2020 is a year that's going to be marking the 150th anniversary of the 15th Amendment and the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment. And this is going to be including Thomas Chester, who is a journalist and attorney, William Howard Day, who's the first black school board president or school board director in Pennsylvania, Jacob Compton, who's a pastor and drove Abraham Lincoln's carriage during the visit to Harrisburg, and Francis Harper, who's a poet and women's rights activist. So these are prominent African Americans that everybody who lives in Harrisburg should know about, and more importantly, anybody who wanders around the Capitol complex will be given some info about. And this is an important project that uh, Lenwood Sloan and this group is working on through Digital Harrisburg to make sure these stories get told. So I encourage you to check those out and dig more. There's resources in the Digital Harrisburg website for teacher resources, and uh, that's a really key point. Passing this along if you're an educator. Uh, this would be something we're looking at and helping to go not just through um, the African-American History Month, but actually entirely through the year so that we build up a understanding of local African-American history. Thanks again for listening. This is the end of this segment, and I hope you continue to follow uh, Chapter 3 with the uh, extension of natural resources. The next, time, next week we're going to be looking at a continuation of historic buildings and then into historic uh, religious structures 